Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the debrief, Geo. How is oneself? Not good. Not good. Um, yeah. I'm still, if anything, I'm more frustrated and angry this morning than was last night. Like I said in the review, I do think it was what happened to George Earth. He sort of killed my emotion a little bit watching it. It was a bit like, oh, it just, I don't know, it just reminds you that there's things bigger than football. But this morning I woke up and I'm feeling really annoyed because it was a huge opportunity yesterday and it does feel a little bit like season's over. Now I know it's mm. not in the sense that we can still qualify for European football, we're still eight, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. However, I'd be lying if I said I was confident that we would go on and finish eighth or higher in the league, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it just feels very... It feels like the end for me, and it's possibly the first time I felt like that with David Moyes as well. We were just looking at him yesterday and I was saying, this is done. This is I've always been 50-50 on whether he's going to get a new contract or not, but yet I'm starting to think that it's just, you know, he, he will be going, but also like this season's just going to sort of fizzle out, really, which is a shame. Yeah, I think I'm not... I'm not um, angry or annoyed or anything. I'm just deflated. I'm just like, oh, okay. It's a, it was a difficult one to take yesterday, I think, because, well, like I said to you at halftime, and I said to Gonzo before the game, I felt if we played crap and got the win, beautiful. Take it, no notes, don't care, right? If we played, if we lost or drew, but we had a good performance, that's fine. I can then, you know, roll that into Thursday and feel like we've got something to build off of or whatever. And it wasn't even like we were, it wasn't even one of those performances where, it wasn't even one of those performances where you just look at it and go, my God, we were battered. It was just, we were just crap. It was just such a deflating crap. It wasn't like angry. It wasn't like, at the time I was annoyed, at the time I was angry, but it wasn't like, now I look back on it, I'm not angry. It wasn't like Liverpool, for example, when we both came on here with fire and fury and we were ready to fight someone because of how bad we were in the cup. It was just like, man, we were just crap. We were so rubbish and Fulham deservedly beat us, roundly beat us. They absolutely nailed it from start to finish. We just got everything wrong. And it's that feeling that I'm, it's that, that's where I'm at this morning. It's not anger. It's not frustration. It's not that. It's just, man, we were just rubbish. And I can't escape that feeling thinking forward to Thursday and partly to the rest of the season as well. But especially Thursday where I'm just like, man, just it just sucks. Yeah, I I am angry though because it's not the first time this season where it feels like there's been an opportunity to kick on a little bit and really take charge of this European race because nobody is. Every team around us is dropping points as well. You know, only Newcastle won at the weekend. Um, Chelsea do play tonight, so they haven't they've yet to play. But um, you know, Man U, Bournemouth, Drew, Wolves, Drew, Brighton, Drew away to Burnley. Um, mm. so everybody's dropping points, but it's just, if it was just I don't know when we played Burnley, when we played Sheffield United, where there's been games, it's like, right, we win this, we take charge of the European race, and we possibly make ourselves favorites, and we just throw it away. And yesterday, like, Fulham deserved to win, but there was no tactical genius plan for Marco Silva, there was no incredible performance from Fulham yesterday. They, they were good and they deserved to win. But I do think the defeat was very self-inflicted. A lot of the chances they had came from our players' individual efforts. And that's what's made me really angry because I really want to paid football next season. And, like, Moyes might not be here. Some of the players that we've seen yesterday might not be here next season. I don't care. The fans will be here next season. And I wanted European football again. And I want to see... I can take getting beat... But I, I don't know if Arsenal fans feel like this, but I think there's got to be an element of them which looks at the game yesterday thinking Emery just got his spot on. It was a good game, but they were just better than us on the day. And they can come away from the defeat with a held head high to some extent. We can't do that yesterday. There was no fight. There was nothing. We were just rubbish. The first seven minutes was good. After that, it was crap. We barely created anything whatsoever. And we look like a team... We looked like the team that were 13th in the Premier League yesterday, not like a team that had European football to play for. It looks like yesterday it looked like some of the players had checked out, the manager had checked out, but I haven't, and a lot of the fans haven't. Some of them have. Some of the fans have checked out a long time ago, and I get it. They don't need to explain it. 
But when there's the chance of European football next season on the line, I will not do that because I really want it. And I just didn't feel like the players wanted it yesterday. And that's what's made me feel really angry. It was almost like they couldn't be bothered um, because if the manager's going, even more reason to get European football so you can attract possibly a higher calibre of manager to the football club. Say, right, okay, well, the gaffers go, let's get European football so the Sullivan or Steiden, whoever they believe is going to go get him, can go get a top, top manager here next season and we can go compete for a trophy. We can go win the Commons League again. We can challenge for the Europa League, whatever it is. But there was just nothing, absolutely nothing yesterday. It looked like a team that couldn't be arsed and, and that was it. And we got beat fair and square and comfortably so by what is an average Premier League side. They were good yesterday, but they're not. That was their third away win of the season. They're not fantastic. Decent team, mm. well coached and organised, and they won comfortably. I think I think I would put more um I think I would I think I would love more praise Fulham's way. Um, not that that's the reason we lost, but I do think they were, I would go further than good. I would probably say they were pretty good. Um, they had what they needed to do down pat. And I think when you say we were good for the first seven minutes or so, I think, or however long it was, I think the difference is, is they hadn't scored yet. I think they, for, for lack of a better term, Geo, they moist balled us. It's it exactly did. what we want to do. The big, yeah. now, now, the big difference between, uh, the big difference between the two is I would say, the way they attacked was a lot more, how do I word it? Over the last two seasons, I think we've seen ourselves getting better players like the likes of Pakatar, for example, and we have been a bit more, a bit more technical with it than maybe perhaps we need to be. They didn't have that joy, right? Don't get me wrong, Pereira, good player. It will be, I've always liked, you know, this. I have a, I have a, I have a, I have blinkers on when it comes to Alex Awobi. I think he's a good player, despite. All, but I think I don't think they have the quality there that we have, right? And I think what's happened is we've lost a little bit of that edge to us, where it was, it was as effective as it needed to be. There was no, there was no funny business. There was no fancy stuff going on with Fulham. They would take, they would, whenever they would go forward very very direct very quickly and hey if they can't go forward what do they do they turn it and pass it backwards but not just backwards they would pass it as far backwards as humanly possible we're talking willian in his own half passing it all the way back to the goalkeeper and then they just reset and then they pass it unbelievably slowly incredibly dangerously as well to give them this is this is somewhere where i would give them credit their passing around at the back was unhinged that was some of the stuff they were doing. And part of it is, you know, you've got Anurabai, you've got Bassi, who are decent players to sort of deal with it. But part, some of those passes were... Yeah, but we're, were, also not good at, we're, we're also not good at pressing. No I, no, I agree. But don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is they would take these risks at the back, which was stupid of them, but they did it and it, they, they paid off for them because that tempted us in. We're, oh, we're going to go, we're going to go press. We're going to get in there. And then the second we do that, there's lines and then they're just like, woof. Big direct balls down the line on the floor to a Wobi to uh, Willian, and then a quick interchange. Bop, bop, bop. No messing around. They're in, run back. Bosh, goal. And I think that's the sort of stuff I saw West Ham doing two years ago. And in the last two years, we've moved slowly away from. Well, last year we moved way too fast away from that, and it went incredibly wrong for us. But even this year, we've sort of not really had as much of that quick transition sort of flair. It's all way too slow for me. And I think that was a big difference. So when, for example, we were talking about how do we change it up? Let's look at the bench. We were talking about it at half time. People are bringing up, for example, Maxwell Cornet as an option. And I'm like, but that's not what we need right now. Like they're sitting, they're sitting there. They're deep. They've scored. They're moist boarding us. They've scored. They can sit deep and they can just go, come on then, break us down. We can't do it. And then they counterattack. And it's like, in those moments, you need something more than that quick counterattack, that quick uh, breakaway to score because there's nothing to break away against. They're already deep. And it reminded me of two years ago in the sense of when we had those moments two years ago, when we came up against teams who played like Fulham or who played like David Moyes and West Ham were playing, we were never able to break them down. And although we've added the players like Pakatar and people like that who are better on the ball and, and a bit more fancy and a bit more technical, we just couldn't break them down. And I think part of that is that, and I don't want to put this solely on, we're going to get into Pakatar because I think me and you probably share very, we, we probably share our opinion on Pakatar yesterday, whereas uh, some other people might say other things, but this isn't to put it all on him. 
but he's the sort of guy who you bring in to be able to break it, those teams down. You're like, right, we don't have that in our locker. Let's get him in. He's really good at the nice, intricate passing stuff. He can get those balls in. And hey, listen, there were times where he did it okay, but it was, it was just a consistent failure to be able to play the balls into those boxes and to break that team down. That's the big difference. We just couldn't do it. Fulham asked the question and we just didn't have the answer. Yeah, we have better players, but they were the better team. Yeah. And I think... The, the funny irony out of all of this is that sort of Fulham played sort of Moyes ball, and you would think David Moyes would know the weaknesses of that system, given that it's sort of his blueprint as well. Yeah, it, it feels like we didn't know how to. It, it almost felt like Moyes didn't know how to break down a David Moyes team. Yeah, and as a manager, you will know your strengths, but you will also bloody know your weaknesses as well, where you constantly get done or where. It's a hidden weakness where teams haven't exploited it yet, but you're not com confident it's going to hold out. But there was none of that going on. And in the end, it was just like hopeful punts into the box to some extent where we were winning nothing in the air. Um, and it was, it was, there was just nothing. There was no invention. There was no creativity. There was no idea. There was no plan. There was nothing. It was just like hoping somebody was going to do something. We were just relying on the X factor, but unfortunately he was getting d bullied in the middle of the park and rolling around and could just didn't have his shooting boots on and was restricted in the damage he could cause. Um, and, you know, the one player that was causing damage was Mikel Antonio as a left winger. Um, mm. th th it, was just, it was just crap from start to, well, the crap from the eighth minute onwards yesterday. Uh, I didn't enjoy it whatsoever and I'm just really pissed off because... Yeah, this is all season. I've been predicting eighth, Charlie. This is the first time I ain't predicting eighth anymore, and I do not like it. Yeah, it's it's really difficult to think about. It's it's really difficult in the wake of it to feel um, any sort of uh, any sort of forward momentum with the with the season. You know, you don't just feel like you just come to an absolute standstill. And obviously, we have a hard run in, but I would usually feel. I would usually feel relatively confident in those sort of games, but I feel like the fact that we've got Leverkusen next and we know we're probably going to get beat there. Um, it's just not even that. Like There's a game before it. Tonight, um, Chelsea play Everton, and I can't even pretend. Like, oh, on Saturday, I'll be honest with you, because I thought we were going to win against Fulham. Silly me. On Saturday, I was thinking, right, let's hope Newcastle lose. Obviously, they didn't. But then the 3 p.m. games got underway. I thought, right, let's hope Forrest can do something against Wolves and Burnley can do something against Brighton. Both things happened. Bournemouth played Man U. I thought, what's the best result here? So I, was, I was thinking, is it Bournemouth to lose so they can't catch us? Is it Man U to lose so we can go about them and finish the draw? I thought, that's possibly the best result, actually. But my point is, I was interested in other games because how it impacted West Ham. Tonight, Chelsea play Everton. I'm not arsed in this. Like, I'll watch the game, but that's just because I like watching Premier League football. Yeah. But 24 hours before we play Fulham, I was rooting for the other teams, thinking this is good for West Ham. Everton could win tonight, and I, and I probably won't flinch. It'll be a bit of, well, whilst it's not bad, it doesn't really do anything because we're still not going to finish in European football. The enthusiasm's just been punched out of me yesterday. Not sucked out of me, it's been punched out of me by the way that we played, which is funny because nobody else had that aggression yesterday. Um we just we just got done anyway you can read some comments out if you want Charlie you can get involved. Yeah I mean the first one was the first one was the the one positive of the game I felt like was George Earthy. And I don't want to go straight back into the negativity again. But I mean I said at half time I would have considered bringing him on uh, my sleep deprived state described it as wiggliness, which I look back at now as being accurate, but also definitely not the word to use. Um, but he showed when he came on, I thought he had, um, I thought he looks genuinely good. Like the, the, the small link up plays, he was doing all the things that I wanted Pakatar to do that he wasn't doing, which is getting the simple stuff right and then driving the team forward with it. Little one two passes here and there, nothing too fancy, but then getting the team going forward. And he looked really bright. And in a game where we didn't seem to have anything else. That was the one thing that sort of gave me hope yesterday was his performance. And then obviously he ends up getting clattered and going off. But uh, what did you make of his very short cameo, I guess? Because I think it was the one part. Uh, it was promising. He looked sharp. I think you've seen the significant difference between a youngster with his career ahead of him and lots of enthusiasm compared to a more senior player coming on who's 
a bit deflated and perhaps resigned to what's going on at West Ham this season. I thought you maybe seen the difference between a player who's not arsed about whether the manager stays or goes and George Earthy compared to a player that might be bothered about what's happening with the manager. I don't know, but I feel like there was a, a significant difference between George Earthy and a lot of the players that started and then came on yesterday. And I think if everybody had the attitude George Earthy had yesterday, I think we might have had a different outcome. Mm. But he, he looked... He looked decent in his short spell, some nice passes. It's difficult to read too much into it, given it was so short. But in a game which you're lacking everything, you will yeah. cling to any positive. And George Earthy was a positive, and it was one of few positives from yesterday's match, so you're going to cling to it. I don't want to go too OTT, because I've seen somebody suggest that he had glimpses of Phil Foden about him, which I think is... A wild statement to make off the back of a cameo like that. Um, but it, it was positive. I don't want to poo poo it too much, but at the same time, I'm trying to not sit here and make on that we've just witnessed the next Messi. Um, big fan of Earthy, big fan of a couple of the players from the 21s. I've always thought he wouldn't perform under da- or play under David Moyes because of his physical stature. I think he's too small. So I was pleased to see him come on, but I think. 2-0 down at home to Fulham's an easy environment to put a player like that on. But you just sort of, sort of credit to Moyes. You didn't have to put him on. Bear in mind, you put him on above Corny. So if you ever want to tell a player he's done at West Ham, that's how you do it. But he came on. I was pleased to see him come on. But I can't lie, Charlie, because I was in such a mood yesterday. I did sit there and think, where was this six months ago? You know, he might have had six months under his belt now and be ready for these kind of games. Um, so I've just got I've got a spiteful side to me in the last 20 hours. I, I, I don't like it, but I would because I've seen other people saying the same thing and I would push against it. Although I agree and I would have played him a lot earlier, I'm not gonna get spiteful when the right thing finally happens that it was too late to happen. Um and I don't think you believe it was too late to happen to uh, yeah, I would yeah, I would not too late maybe, but but later than it should have been, hundred percent. Like if I'm in charge, George Earthy and other young players, Mubama's the big one, would be getting games a long, long time ago. Like, we'll be getting minutes a long, long time ago. Um, and I think I don't want to be in that position where where what I believe the right thing to happen. And I mean to go, well, why didn't it happen earlier? And especially in a situation where you say he would have been ready. I think he was ready. I think he turned up. I think he played well. I think what he did was good. Was good. It just didn't end up lasting long enough. Even, even the way he got injured, right? Even the way the incident happened, it was because he was charging after the ball to try and yeah. get involved and try and do things. For me, it wasn't a case of... Um, him, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever suggest that he didn't feel ready when he played. Uh, I would play him 100 percent before, but I don't want to shoot shots at something that I actually agree with happening just because it didn't happen soon enough. I'm like, well, that's a positive. Especially, maybe if, maybe if everything goes, else was going right and that went wrong, then I'd probably be like, well, what the hell's so, that? Can I, when can everything's I, going wrong, can then, I yeah. throw you a really weird analogy? No, if your missus you know. burns your tea, are you happy she's taken out, even if it's burnt? Because um, it's well, first of all, she she I'm, I'm, the co- I'm the cook of the house, so that would be con- so I would uh, it'd be a concerning situation all round. Um, no, no, because that's my tea, Gio, and this is vitally important to Charlie Walsh's life is food, you know what I mean? I've got an unopened packet of McCoys right here. This is what's happening after the stream. Food is a big thing in my life, more than George That is, not steak ones. That is poor because uh, I've just got the multi pack one, so. We have the we have the multi pack of the usual ones, and then um, I can't do the, that. The big ones, the big ones are the sweet chicken, the sweet Thai chicken, or whatever they're called. Those ones contains ones contains cheese and onion ones. I don't like cheese and onion anyway. But the cheese and onion McCoy's are good. Put, I, I don't like any onion. cheese and onion crisps. I don't like them anyway. I can I can understand that once, but I think those ones are good. Anyway. Um, Bro says what I would say, Gio, is that they've made a mistake and then so on. It was uphill task, and we have so many individual errors this season. That's what's cost us around ten points. I would say. I mean, again. It's not. I think they had other chances to score, but it is notable that both of their goals came from very uh, avoidable errors. Two from Pakitar, uh, the touch from Mavropanos, although I think he's doing the right thing. There's so many things around that. That first goal, there's so many individual stupid errors in there. The Pakitar thing at the beginning of it, the ball in, Woods feels preventable. Fabianski rushes out to try and stop it, even though he's never going to get there. Aguerd does not track Pereira in any way, shape, or... Aguerd's tracking for Pereira. He doesn't know he... I'm, I'm not even sure he thinks he exists at this point in time. He was so anonymous to him. It was insane. If you um, if you watch the second goal as well and just pick a player, just, just as Paqueta loses the ball, just pick a West Ham player and watch him. 
and you'll find yourself annoyed with every single one of them. Like Gerard, Alvarez, Zuma, Ben Johnson. It doesn't matter which one you watch. Just watch him from Paquetta losing the ball to the ball hitting back the net. And just watch that one West Ham. Just do player cam and you will get really annoyed uh, because they, oh, they're all incorrect with what they do, really. Johnson is just next to Pereira when Paquetta loses the ball. And he's five yards ahead of him when he puts in the back of the net. And he's just like, he's just jogging. Johnson's just like, jo- jo- well, it's like a fast jog, but he's certainly not sprinting back. Um, mm. And you just watch it. You think, what's this? What's going on? You know, Gerard gets sucked in, loses a ball, but he goes out to him half heartedly and basically gives him three yards to tee up his cross and put it into the, the box. He, he, it's just every player you watch, you're just thinking, what on earth are you doing? Um, mm. It just gets worse and worse the more you watch it. I, I agree. There was a lot of individual energy yesterday. There was plenty of them. But the thing is, Charlie, if we, if that type of performance yesterday felt like a one-off as a team, you could say, well, it's down to the individual mistakes. But because we play like this frequently, it's hard to put it down to individual errors. It Does that mm. loot cost us the game? Yes. But that's not the reason we didn't get back into the game. The reason we didn't get back into the game is tactical and due to player performance further up the pitch, etc., etc. It's because of Paquette and Mavapanos and then a handful as to why we conceded two goals. But it's not Mavapanos' fault that we didn't score. Mm. Although yeah. saying that, he was at fault for losing the possession a few times. But... Yeah, he had. He very much was playing like a man who knew he'd made a big mistake and was like, "No, I'm going to correct this by doing something, picking up the ball, driving mad distances with it, like poor passes at the end of it, just sort of desperate." And to an extent, like I guess you could level some a similar criticism at Pakatar, um, to an extent. But yeah, uh, Eamon says problem is our team has holes all over it. No recognised striker, no left winger, no decent central defensive partnership or central defenders that are fully fit or of a good standard. Um, I mean, it's something that's again, I I feel difficult. I, 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 one my, my biggest problem with doing West Ham YouTube, Geo, is I don't like repeating myself constantly. I'm just not some. Once I've said something once, I don't feel the need to say it again and again. Man, our squad building, huh? That's, <laughs> that's shocking. I have to, I can't not say it every single time something goes wrong. I'm just like, imagine if we just had a squad that existed. And I know we have, like, I know, don't get me wrong, there are players that could play more and everything else and this, that, and the other. I don't necessarily disagree with you, but like, holy hell it's just embarrassed it's just shocking it's just shocking man like you look at it you go all right antonio's can't do it what we got danny ings okay sure all right sure what we got okay right so we need to antonio uh, bowen's out because of you know things that are unforeseeable or whatever so then what have we got after that no one oh okay okay good it's just like it's just a mess it's just a, and it's only this summer's only going to get worse because you can't you cannot with all the problems we've got with the, with the things we have to deal with already plus the people who are going to be leaving either on free transfers contracts ending or people we expect to leave like Pakatar, for example you can't address all of them in a season you just can't you, in, a, in a single window you can't um and so it's only it's only going to carry on i mean we're paying the price for having I mean, year, like literally years and years and years and years and years of just completely nonsensical squad building it's horrendous it's and i hate saying it because i don't like repeating myself but my god is it just so like it's it's a joke it's ridiculous even if you look even if you look at fulham right and fulham remember they came up two years ago it was two years ago it was two years ago wasn't it yeah. and they it's had that the summer window season. yeah and they had that summer they had that summer window that everyone was like what the what the hell are you doing like you've spent so much money it's a complete mess blah 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 all this other stuff Fulham seem to have a more complete squad than we have. And they've been in the championship for half of it. So I don't understand how we... Well, I do understand. I know exactly why we're in this position. But I don't understand how it can be a situation in which we're in this position when we've had consistent European football. So we've had more money than we've ever had. We've had more opportunities than we've ever had. We managed to sell Declan Rice for a huge amount of money, which means financially we're in a good position because we don't have to worry as much about, you know, ffp or whatever you want to call it these days like in those sort of senses and yet somehow we've got a squad that's absolutely all over the shop i don't, I don't know, like anything people. you've said and this is why i'm i'm nervous for the summer because i'm just not convinced west ham know who they want to be their new manager if they want a new one because i think we would have heard about it 
if you go back to the summer, mm. even though, I mean, I say Tim Steiden's come in as if it's going to make it better. Tim Steiden literally uses social media to boost his own profile. Um, it's probably, this is a completely different topic and conversation, but, you know, Fabrizio Romano in the last couple of months almost has been exposed for being cashing in on um, boosting availability of players, coaches and managers, shall we say, where... Mm. Like I said, it's it's a it's, it's, this is a big to- I say big topic. It's a it's a different topic, but it's, Tim Steiden doesn't mind giving information to people. He doesn't mind short interviews with his favourite journalists and stuff, and not one mention of sort of if a new manager's coming or going. So it's sort of like. But my point is, is the in the no stuff is the leaks going to stop because of Steiden? I would say absolutely not because he's doing some of the leaks. Now, he yeah. doesn't tend to do it until it's done deal, i.e. Caduce is on his way to West Ham. But the picture of Tim Steiden and Mohamed Caduce came out before Mohamed Caduce was a West Ham player. Right? There's only there's, there's only so many people that have that. There's only four of them on the bloody plane. Um, so there's only so many people can post that <laughs> photo somewhere, right? Um but there's just nothing about this about the new manager West Ham are going to get. There's all these links to certain managers. Mourinho have been a hell no, but Mourinho being the recent one. And I just have a fear that the club might go, okay, we're not going to renew David Moyes' contract. And it's okay, so who do we go get? And they go, I don't know. Who, who do you think we should go get? Despite the fact that they've had over a year to plan for this, I just get this fear that we're not ready because we had a year to, well, we had more than that, but we had a year to plan for Declan Rice departing. And our answer was to buy a player from a relegated Premier League side. So are you telling me our whole plan to replace Declan Rice relied on Southampton being relegated? Because that was just a wild transfer strategy, if so. And it wasn't. It was just an opportunity. Southampton went down and thought, brilliant, now we can go get that player Moyes once. Let's go get him. So the, to one of the players we wanted to replace Declan Rice was done off the back of a Premier League club being relegated the same we, season. To, to be fair, we don't know that there might not have been a second option if that wasn't the case. If Southampton stay up and they can charge way more for James Rockhurst than what they did, maybe we have another person. But I, the, the, reason I, the reason I struggle to believe that, Charlie, is because we didn't sign anyone until after the season had kicked off. No, I Listen, I, again, continue, and this is the thing. I know, I know people are going to bring up Moyes and I know people are going to say everything else. This is one of the consistent problems with West Ham is we spend too bloody long doing these things. We never we never just get out again. This is one of the big hopes. And it's like, I disagree with some of your criticisms of Steiden, but I certainly don't feel the... Um, I certainly don't feel the... I'm not sat here basking in the light of Tim being like, we are sorted. The future's bright, boys. It's going to be beautiful. Because some of the consistent problems we've had at West Ham pre-Moyes, pre-Stiden, still continue to, to exist when they were both here, which is, for example, one of the examples is this. We take too long doing these things. We don't just go out and get stuff sorted. Now, we did a little bit in here and there, and I was quick to praise those things when they happened, when we went and did getting... like. The carer deal going out, for example, is one of the things I was like, good, right. We know what we're doing. We're getting on and doing it. And then the rest of the time we stand there, we're just twiddling our thumbs. And it's like, well, what happened, guys? <laughs> we started, we seem to have a plan. And now it's just sort of gone out the window. Um, so I, I don't, I, I, it's frustrating to me because I know people like, obviously the moist thing I feel like is a separate issue, but it, it, it's, it gets into every facet of West Ham in the way we talk about everything. It's just always going to be there until he goes and whatever it is, what it is. But I, I find myself at a loss at this point because I want to be super positive about, you know, we've got Tim, let's figure it out, let's move forward. But it's it's one player, it's one person in a structure. You know, a structure is so much bigger than that. You know, you're only as good as your weakest part or whatever. Well, our weakest part is we've got gaping holes in the structure everywhere and we're still struggling to figure out how to deal with these things. And that can only take time to get there. And I don't know how much patience we have to even sort that out, let alone if we'll ever even get there in the first place. And it's really, really difficult to feel like we have even the remotest uh, component parts to sort out the problems in which we already have, let alone the problems that are going to be coming down the line. Yeah, I mean, I don't think is I don't have much criticisms of Tim. I think he's only done two things wrong. 
since he's been here. One was the very end of the summer transfer window. He went to Brazil, and I, t- I feel we needed a striker, and he came back empty-handed. So when it was sort of crunch time of the transfer window, he was all legs in one basket, and it didn't work out. And, you know, and I, he's gone back there now, so he's obviously got plans or some people or one person in particular who really wants it could be a manager it could be this could be massive smoke and mirrors um gabriel hines is based out there isn't he he's been tipped for a move to england to be the um i know he's in argentina rather than brazil but he's been tipped with a move to come and join man united as a, as a coach or something maybe stiden's identified him in the past as an upcoming manager and he's gone out to to get his man or something i don't know but he's gone out there again so i think that was the one thing got slightly wrong but it wasn't the biggest deal in the world and the other thing you got wrong i believe in this i always say this all depends on who and what you believe we don't all believe the same thing but i believe he negotiated with the wrong agent for abraham osman and the reason i believe that is because the danish fa released a statement and if you think sliding didn't do that that's fine but then you have to then say that the danish fa are lying and I, sh- mm. I just struggle to believe that the Danish, Danish FA would lie. It's it's not something I, 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 I can remotely convince myself of. So I think Steiden negotiated with an incorrect agent regarding Abraham Osman, um, which was an error, but I don't think it was one we couldn't rectify. We could have done. And this is where I blame Sullivan more than anybody else. I think Sullivan was the one that pulled the rug on it because I think an agent got in Sullivan's ear about Osman and Yota and um, we end up with nobody. We end up empty-handed because Sullivan went back to what he trusts because we've, like I said, we've got three people. We've got three people at the club with the manager, the chairman, director of football. Forget the the names of these people that's the three positions and they've all got different ways and strategies of doing transfer windows so the chairman likes his football agents the director of football likes to use his scouting network and his data and the manager prefers tried and trusted players who Mm. are of sound character they've all got different ways of doing things so it's always going to be difficult i was almost quite impressed by how we did the last summer transfer window to come out of it with an okay a decent bit of business there, but January was a shambles. And I'm not surprised when you've got three cooks all with different recipes, it's it's never gonna end well. They're all trying to cook the same meal, but with different mm-hmm. methods and ingredients, Charlie. It's never gonna end well. Um, it was a disaster. And I blame David Sullivan first and foremost, and most. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't usually do this, but Audi, listening would be your friend. I'm just saying, if you listened. Before you typed, it might help you. Listen to the words nah, and you I might get there eventually, my G. I have no problems with you individually, Audi. I'm just saying, you got two I of do, them. I do, because he makes shit up. <laughs> well, I do. He just makes stuff up. I reckon Audi should stop being David Sullivan's biggest fan. You hate to see it. You really do. And so, well, when someone just is desperate must, to be liked Audi by David loves, Sullivan. Like. Audi loves David Sullivan, and I can't believe it. Cannot believe Audi loves David Sullivan. Just a, it's just a stress. Doug says to play devil's advocate, uh, wouldn't he play? Wouldn't he ask Osman uh, for his agent details or, or contact book type thing? Um, start negotiations. Here's my thing: once you've realised you've started, once you once once the mistake has happened, right? I don't mind mistakes happening, right? In life, in work, I don't care. But it's, mistakes happen. It is what it is. You could just rectify it. Surely, if you if you if you were like if the club was like right, Osman's our guy. Let's go get Osman. And you go, oh crap, we've been negotiating with some joke man for the last two weeks, whatever it is. Just speak to the normal guy. It's not that difficult. Surely, just go. Oh, we'll sp- fine. Our oh, bad. Get bog off. Let's speak to the proper guy. What happened there? I think I think the club probably got worried that legally it was going to be a bit of a minefield because the other agent was claiming that Osman was his player. And to, to, mm, to yes, the vibe, yes, the feeling, yeah. guessing, um, I was, I the feeling I was getting was that the incorrect agent had some sort of dealings with, and possibly even a contract with Osman. It's just that the English agent, who was the correct one, had an original contract, and it was almost like the player thought he could break it, and it turns out he couldn't, kind of thing. But anyway, regardless, Brighton got it sorted a week later. Um, and he's off there in the summer, so I know, I know. Um, where is it? I just was something. 
Steve says, I wonder how Flynn Downs would have done given half a chance better than James Will Prowse, I'll suspect. Here's the thing. James Will Prowse and Flynn Downs are both exactly have exactly the same problem, right? In that they don't fit the system we're playing and yet we've spent money to try and get them in. Flynn Downs was worth a risk, right? I don't think, I think it was clear he wouldn't fit the system, but it was worth the risk. It wasn't that much money. He was doing big things. I would argue we probably got the wrong guy out of Swansea in the first place, but whatever. He supported the club. He's English. There was lots of, there was lots of positives to it, but he never fit, which is why when he was playing in here, there and everywhere position, I actually liked his performances. And then he was, when he was playing in the registered position, I was like, this guy is, oh, this guy's a lost quartz. I didn't know what the hell was going on there. And I think with James Will Prowse, there is something similar to be said where when he's playing in what we would consider the registered position, which is centre midfield, defensive midfield, deeper, blah, 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 blah. He looks absolutely lost because that's just not his style of football to play like that. Whereas if he's playing in the 10, that's where I like James Will Prowse because he gets on, he does the things he's good at. And then you also get the added benefit of, look, he can take corners, he can take free kicks and all that. But he does, he gets the, the harrying and the chasing on. Whereas yesterday, again, sat deeper, deeper than Alvarez a lot of the time, which was I was getting so frustrated watching that. You have Alvarez and you have James Will Prowse. You're facing a team who are consistently just passing it straight through the middle of you. Who's going to be the one you have? James Will Prowse. Basically, the one thing that he's useful in in this system is pressing. He's good at pressing. You have Alvarez, who's good at cutting things out and is good at anticipation. What do you do? Oh, let's have Alvarez press and James Will Prowse be the guy sitting deep. What is going on here? It's just backwards. The whole thing is just backwards. Um... And so I look at Downs. Downs is one of those people who like, he exists at the club. Future, if a new manager comes in, then we can reassess it. But until a new manager comes in, he's just going to have to exist on the peripheries or we sell him. That's fine. It just is what it is. He's, I don't, I don't see the, I don't see the point in even beginning to think about it, do you? Yeah, I've, I've only seen him a handful of times. I've only seen a handful of Southampton games this season. One of the games I watched, he, he, he wasn't playing. He was injured. Um, but I, I see you got the winner at the weekend. I'm pleased for him because Southampton fans are raving about him. He's having a really good season. And I seen his interview, Downs' interview last week or his comments last week where he said, I don't know what the future holds for me. He said, I don't know if I'm going back to West Ham. I don't know if I'm staying at Southampton. And he basically said, nobody's spoken to me about it. And I thought no. that was a bit sad, actually, because it's coming up to the end of the season. He's had a really good year under his belt. And I'd imagine the last thing you want to do is when you're going into the summer is don't know what you're doing next season. I think, you yeah. know, you, you want that security. You want to go away for your, your, you go for your month away with your family and have a break. It's been a long season. Regardless of where you've been, it's, been, it's, a, it's a long season. And having that uncertainty cannot be healthy. Whereas maybe he's loving at Southampton and Southampton get promoted. Mm. I'd forgive him if he wants to move there permanently so that he can have a go at Premier League football. Um, but at the minute, he just doesn't know. So do I think he'll get another shot? Would I rather have him at West Ham? I'd rather have him here than not have him here just because of how light the squad is. Um, but I'd also I'd also rather have him here because of all the benefits he does bring. Like if we yeah. had if we were playing a system where he actually worked, whether or not he was good enough for the Premier League is a different question, but we can figure that out. But if we played that system, there's huge benefits. He's a, he supports West Ham. He's English, which helps with the quota. And clearly at Southampton and then previously at Swansea, he's shown himself as being worth the chance of playing in the but Premier I don't, League. I, I'm I would not be more convinced you've got a chance though, Charlie. I'm not convinced he... The only reason he may have got a chance is because Jack Combice isn't here anymore. Last season... Sure. Yeah. So he was trying to get into a midfield which consisted of Thomas Suchek and Declan Rice. And whilst it wasn't necessarily working, that's two players Moyes is unwilling to drop. Whereas this season, Moyes is showing that he's willing to drop Ward House and Thomas Suchek. Um, yeah. And Alvarez has obviously been suspended. There's been a couple of games where, you know, Burnley away, I remember Moyes saying that Alvarez was so knackered, they basically convinced him to give an hour, and that was it. You know, a game like that, maybe he would have started. So he would maybe have picked up some game time this season, but I don't feel like he would have. The, no, this this, this, this move season has actually been fantastic for Flynn Downs. Yes, yeah, I agree. I agree. We've done we've done what we usually don't do. We said did the same thing with Kara. Is it's not working out? Let's get him on loan. Let's just let's just. Even if that is somehow kicking the can down the road, let's just get them to a place which is going to work perfectly for them. They're going to fit in, which Flynn Downs has undoubtedly. And all of a sudden, he's worth money. So if we wanted to sell him, we could do it. And we've kept him in a place where he's actually playing consistently. He's playing well. Perfect. Absolutely. No notes. Beautiful. We've done that. 
well. We yeah. did care her well. There's been other things, which again, we speak about the weakest link being David Moyes. I don't think it is. Again, I think we have holes in it. Like when you look at what happened with Marshall and West Brom, clearly there's still not... You're never going to get 100% hit rate with these things regardless. But clearly there's still problems because both me and you pointed out that West Brom and we both went, they've just signed someone else. It doesn't really feel like the correct move to have him going there. Whereas Flynn Downs, no, no, it's perfect. We, we absolutely nailed that. And I strongly agree with you with the sort of like, hit, one of the biggest tragedies is him saying he doesn't know what's going to happen next year. Because like you say, going into that, you want nothing more than to know what you're going to be doing. And he's just now, it's now essentially another victim of the indecisions that the club have because we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you said it last night, you said it today about not being sure about whether Moyes is staying next year or not, but you're like being more and more convinced he's not. I don't think we've made a decision on it, frankly. No, I, I think, think there's still, I think we're still a month to go and I think it could, I think the decision could change three or four if, times between now and then. If I'm guessing, it's that the club have decided they're not going to give him a new contract but they're too pussy to tell them. I mean, potentially, but you're telling me, let's say, let's say, for the sake of argument, we won every single game between now and the end season. Actually, no, ignore that. Let's say we ended up winning the Europa League somehow. He'd stay. Yeah. So it doesn't, so it doesn't, so it doesn't, like, we haven't made the decision one way or the other, you know? Yeah, I agree with that. But I think, barring a miracle happening, I think that's possibly the scenario we're looking at now. And the problem, but the problem being, if we don't, if we're not publicly doing that decision or even privately doing that decision, that you've got people like Downs who sat there. And not just that, other people like... And also for Steiden or whoever's going to be in charge of transfers. How are you supposed to go around and figure out what you're going to be doing if you don't even know who's going to be the manager? Like, don't get me wrong, David. Mo if David Moyes is here, you start planning for David Moyes. But everyone in the fan base who wants David Moyes to go, for the most part, want a different style of football. There are some people who say they want Jose Mourinho or Marco Silva or whatever, and I'm like, it's basically the same style of football. I don't know what you want here, but it's fine. Um... Like the vast majority of them want a more attacking, more possession based, whatever you want, whatever the metric you want to use is style of football. And so what, who are you going to buy? What are you going to do for these positions? Are you going to go out and buy a winger who's like someone who's going to be cut inside and go for goal, kind of like Kudus? Are you going to go buy a winger who's more like Pablo Fornals, who can drop deep and sort of work in those sort of scenarios? Are you going to buy a winger who is more like Pakatar, who can drop deep and dictate play in a different kind of way? Are you going to buy a winger like Maxwell Cornet, who's just going to run down the wing and put it in the box? Like, what are you going to do? You've got no idea. It's insane. And so it's not just Flynn Downs that's going to struggle because that's all of us. And when we're going into a situation where we have an stupidly difficult summer to deal with, what? how are we going to plan for that? How are we going to even begin to think about that if the club aren't sure? Because again, like you, I probably there is probably a prevailing feeling about what's going to happen next year. But I, I, I said this months ago when people were saying it's done, he's gone, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, bro, I promise you it will change 15 times between now and the end of the season. And if we beat Say we, say we somehow, I don't think we will. Say, for, to be clear, for people like Audi who don't listen, right? I don't think we're going to beat Leverkusen. Let's say we beat Leverkusen. In fact, I'll look at the camera like some other people want. We I don't think we're going to beat Leverkusen. We will lose. If we beat Leverkusen and all of a sudden we're in a final and all of a sudden it's a one-off game and we manage to get a win in it like we did against Fiorentina despite being probably the worst team, he, he will stay. And it's that indecision that's madness to me. Yeah, because I don't, I'm I, I have my opinion. You have your opinion. Everyone in the chat has your opinion and their opinion. But ultimately, it does not really matter what our opinions are. It only matters what the actual forward momentum of the club is. And if we don't have an opinion on what that's going to be, you can't move forward. You're just stuck here, and that's the worst thing that could possibly happen in this scenario. Because Gia, what do you always say? If you're not moving forward in football, you're moving back. Yeah, no such thing as standing still in football. Exactly. Either going forwards or backwards. Well, yesterday we went backwards, didn't we? Um, yeah. But any last things to say about Fulham before we end? No, the only thing I'll say is um, I quite like Howdy actually, because usually I'm the person that struggles to hear the most because of my hearing deficiency. <laughs> but Audi's actually outdone me, so <laughs> thank you, Audi. <laughs> Uh, it's positive silver linings everywhere yeah silver linings yeah yeah, yeah. um so so but in in all seriousness <laughs> i'm still i'm still just really disappointed with yesterday um this is the first time and my, my, my i'm hoping my mood changes as we get closer to thursday um but this is the first time this season uh, i feel like i'm just ready for like the season to be over like all season, and I've, I've seen plenty of people say the season's over for them previously, and that's their feeling. 
but I've not had that feeling yet because I believe we could qualify for European football next season. But yeah, t- today is just the first time I just feel a bit just fed up and disappointed, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, same. Let us know in the comment section how you feel. Um, because I pretty much the same. It's just fed up, down deflated. Uh, someone in the chat at the top, in fact, let me see if I can scroll up. Uh, when I was looking to try and figure out what the word was, said Charlie, the word is resigned. I think yeah. resigned is definitely the word. I've seen it, it struck with me as well. Yeah, it's definitely the way I feel. Uh, where is it? Resigned, resigned, resigned. I can find it, I can find it, Geo. I can do it. It's possible. But let us know how you feel in the comment section um, after yesterday. Uh, how do you, do you feel differently after you've now slept on it? How do you feel? We will be back after the um, Leverkusen game to talk about how definitely more YB will be feeling. Um, which I suspect won't be the case. Um, but, you know, maybe it will happen. But before that, of course, we've got the preview. Um, do you have a video going up tonight, Gia? Possibly. Um, I was intending on, but I don't know. I just feel a bit, mm, today. I've got player yeah. ratings in 15 minutes with Gonzo, though. There you go. Well, there's at least something. So if you're on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash hamster chat, link in the description below. I can't find it. Link in the description below uh, to make sure to check out the player ratings. But thank you, everyone. Subscribe if you're new around here because we have plenty more stuff to come. Like I say, leading up to Leverkusen game, we'll have the preview and then, of course, the build-up show, the watch-along, a review of that, and then the debrief the next day uh, and like the video because it helps us out a huge amount. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you all for being here. And uh, we'll see you next time. Cheers, everyone. Bye. <laughs>